Let's all stand together this morning. Everybody's still coming in, so you're going to have to raise your voice to make up for your neighbor that's not here yet. Amen. Let's put our hands together. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you for evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Christ, right. and we're grateful that as a church, we have a part in so many different fields and so many different works all around the world because of our support for our missionaries, for our Bible colleges that are training missionaries, and for even our local works within the United States. So thank you for your faithfulness and giving. 
And I'm excited today as we're going to hear from Brother Nolan and his wife Janae as they're preparing to go to the field that God has called them to in Uganda. Amen? Amen. If you're our guest today, we want to welcome you to Central Baptist Church. Do us a favor. In the seat back in front of you, you'll see a little card called a Connect card. If you'll take a moment today and fill that out for us, we would love to have a written record of your visit with us. If you're online watching, you can go to our website at cbchou.org and you can fill out an online Connect card. We would love to know that you're with us. If you're in the building and you fill that card out on your way out today, there's an offering box by every exit. If you would just drop it in one of those boxes on your way out, we would greatly appreciate it. At this time, I would ask you uh, to bow your heads with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us. We thank you and we praise you for the blessings that you've given to us. We ask your blessings today on this service. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would move and, Lord, that we would respond to you. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's continue singing this morning together. Y'all sound great. My Jesus, I love thee. We all know this very well. We've been learning this over the past few weeks, the past few months. Closer drawn to thee. 
Draw me nearer. Draw me nearer. Nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer. Nearer, blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleeding side. Good morning. I'm, I thank you for braving the rain. Amen. But you know what? If you're not made of salt or sugar, you're not going to melt in it. So you're in good shape. Well, we, we this is Stewardship Month, and this month we're going to be hearing from our missionary families, and we're going to start this morning with Uganda. And then next week you're going to be hearing from Costa Rica, and the next week you'll be hearing from Israel. And so we're just blessed that our missionaries will come. Brother Nolan and his wife are, and excuse the term, they're baby missionaries. This is just their second stop since they started deputation. So we're blessed to be at the very uh, front of his ministry. And we want to make sure that we send him away today encouraged, letting him know that we're not only going to support them financially, but we're going to support them prayerfully. Amen. And so brother, brother, Nolan, you come up, Brother Nolan Eterno, and he'll introduce his wife, Janae, okay? You're all wired up. All right. There. <laughs> all right, like Pastor said, my name is Nolan. This is my beautiful wife, Janae, and our two-year-old son, Kaysen, was over with the kids, and we are the Letourneau family missionaries to Uganda. And we are so grateful to be here this morning with you guys. Um, I love Texas. I am from Texas. So being here is like home, and I love it. Um, those of you that are watching at home, we're so thankful to be here with you as well. And we're so grateful that you can participate in this way. Um, and right now, I'm going to go ahead and let my wife share her testimony with you of how she came to know the Lord and her calling to ministry. Good morning. 
My name is Janae, and I'm very excited to be here. I am from a small country town about an hour west of St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I was actually excited to come to Texas and hope we would escape the snow, but I think we brought it with us. <laughs> Um, I was blessed to grow up in a Christian home. My dad, Joe Nagowski, was my pastor for the first 18 years of my life, and my mom taught junior church, so I knew all the stories, and I prided myself in being the first one to raise my hand. When I was eight years old, I heard the crucifixion story for what must have been the 100th time, but that time when I heard the story, I realized it wasn't just a story. It wasn't a fairy tale, that Jesus was a real man, and he was God's son. He died for a reason, and that reason was my sin. So when I was eight years old, I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal savior. Since then, God started opening doors for me to serve and go on overseas mission trips and started molding my heart. When I was 16, God used a missionary family speaking at my home church to confirm in my heart that there was nothing else I could do with my life except share the gospel with other people. I didn't know where the Lord was leading me at that time, but I knew there was nothing else I should do or could do except to be a missionary. I went to Baptist Bible College when I graduated high school, and that's where I met and married my husband, Nolan. And even through the process of dating and um, engagement in the first few months of marriage, we knew that God had individually called us to be missionaries. We even had a piece that God was calling us to the continent of Africa, but we didn't know where, and we were really anxious. We had our own ideas of what it should look like, and we even had one specific country in mind that had both been in our history, and we thought this would make for a very good story, but God closed the door on that. When missionaries to Uganda came to speak at our church in Springfield, as they were speaking, I remember looking over at Nolan and thinking, this is where God wants us. This is what we've been praying for. God had used specific things that we were praying for that they brought up as they were speaking about Uganda. And we knew that that moment, and then also when we were able to go in 2017 for just over a month, that this is where the Lord was calling us. And you'll see in our video that we learned very quickly that over 50% of the people in Uganda are under the age of 15. It's a country of kids, and the door is wide open for us to help train up a new generation of believers who are firmly grounded on the truth of God, and we're very excited to go. Thank you. Oh, I let her go first because she makes me look good. <laughs> so similar to Janae that um, I grew up in a Christian home. My mom was a Sunday school teacher for years. My dad was a deacon for a short time. Um, I was exposed to the gospel at a very young age, but it wasn't until I was 16 that I truly understood my need for a savior. So on July 4th, 2011, at church camp, I gave my life to the Lord. I asked him to save me from my sins, and I know that he did. And since that day, my life has changed a lot. Um, shortly after I got saved, the Lord began to work on my heart about full-time ministry. I had no clue what that looked like or what that meant. Uh, for someone like me, I grew up very um, insecure and scared to talk to people. Um, doing something like this to this day still kind of makes me a little nervous. Um, but I never thought the Lord could use someone like me. Um, but finally, I did the only thing I knew to do, and that was say, here I am, Lord. I'm willing to do whatever you want. And that's when I surrendered my life fully to, to what the Lord had for me. The Lord then brought me to Baptist Bible College, where I met Janae. The one part she likes to leave out of her testimony was that she turned me down the first time I asked her out. And a lot of that had to do with because she was a missions major, and she knew that God was calling her to missions, and I was running away from what God wanted me to do. I had a plan. I love music. I was going to be a music minister. I was gonna, that's, well, that's how I was going to serve the Lord. But during the whole time, the Lord was calling me to missions, the one area I was not willing or wanted to do. But through different circumstances, different missionaries' testimonies, even having the opportunity to go to Ghana, West Africa, the Lord really broke my heart for missions, made me see that there are millions in this world that have never heard the name of Christ, have never heard the gospel, and that people are dying and going to hell because of that. That broke my heart, and that's when I knew this is what God had for me. You know, I have fears, I have insecurities, but... Telling someone the gospel, I should never be afraid of that about that. And so that's when I knew that I was to be a missionary. Janae and I got married. We graduated from BBC. But during that time, like she said, we felt the Lord leading us to Uganda. When we went over to Uganda in 2017, we saw a beautiful country. It was very peaceful. 
the country just years ago um, had wars and different things going on. They had a dictator ruling over them. And the one thing that we saw when we were there is that they celebrated the fact that they were peaceful. They were a peaceful country. But they weren't really at peace because the spiritual battle for their soul was more present than ever. Many of the majority of the country follows Anglican or Roman Catholicism, and Islam has put their foot in the door and it is growing. But despite all that, many Ugandans still hold to the, to the traditions of witchcraft. We saw a country that celebrated that they were peaceful, but they can't know true peace until they know the peace of Christ. Amen. And that is why we are going to Uganda. I'm going to go ahead and let you guys watch our video, and then I'm going to come back up here and share just a little bit of what God has called us to do there. If you'll go ahead and play our video. Uganda the country known as the Pearl of Africa because of its amazing wildlife and beautifully diverse landscapes. From the snow-capped Aranzori Mountains to the breathtaking shores of Lake Victoria, Uganda is home to over 45 million people. More than 90% of Ugandans hold to the religions of Anglican, Roman Catholicism, and Islam, which is growing at a rapid rate. Despite their claimed religion, the dark traditions of witchcraft still enslave millions of Ugandans. Before the current government, there were many years of civil wars, death, and unrest. Though Ugandans now celebrate political peace, the battle for their souls is more present now than ever. Ugandans cannot know how to have the inner peace between God and man without the truth of God's word. We are Nolan and Janae Letourneau, BBFI missionaries to Uganda, and we are humbled and excited that God has called our family to proclaim the peace of Christ to the Pearl of Africa. With 50% of the country being under the age of 15, there is a huge opportunity to raise up a new generation of Ugandans that is firmly grounded on biblical truths. We have the priceless opportunity to win Ugandans for Christ and to train up leaders, pastors, and teachers to do the work of the ministry in the process of church planting. When we first arrive at Uganda, we will be acclimating to the culture and enrolling in language school. We'll also be working alongside Russ and Sylvia Daniels at Baranga Bible Baptist Church. It is our desire to share the gospel with Ugandans in their own heart language, to train men and women to serve and take ownership of the Great Commission, and then prayerfully seek out a new area for another church plant. There is a great harvest awaiting in Uganda. Would you please consider partnering with us prayerfully and financially as we do what God has called us to do in Uganda? Uganda, like we said, is a beautiful, beautiful country. But that is not why we are going. There are three reasons why we are going to Uganda. The first is because God has called us there. God has called my family to go to Uganda and preach the gospel to those people. That is the first and most important reason why we're going, because God told us to. The second reason we're going is because, just like our video said, these are people that that are happy and they feel peaceful, but they don't, they don't even realize that they don't understand real peace. They need the gospel. Only the gospel can change their lives. The third reason we're going is because there's a huge need to train up leaders. When we went to Uganda, both Janae and I had separate opportunities where we got to work with individuals. Janae met a lady named Fiona. She was one of the Sunday school teachers. And Fiona came to Janae after one day of junior church and just told Janae, we need you to come because we don't know how to teach kids like you are, like you're doing. We don't know how to tell them about Jesus like you're doing. Will you please come and show us how to do that? I met a man named Cheyune, had the very similar story. He, he said, we need help. We need someone to come and train us. We are going to Uganda first and foremost, to tell people about Jesus and win them for the Lord. But in that, we're going to do exactly what the Great Commission says. We're going to win them for Christ, and then we're going to disciple them. 
that they, and train them so that they will be able to reproduce themselves. And during that time, we are going to be praying, prayerfully seeking out new opportunities, new places to plant churches so that the gospel can be reached to the entire country of Uganda. Our goal is to get to Uganda in two years. Like Pastor said, we just started. This is, you all are our second church on our deputation travels. So we are, we've just started this. Our goal is two years, and we know that God can do that. We know he can. But there's, some, there's a lot of things that, that, that we need to do before we get over there. And there's a lot of things that we need to raise. One specific area that I will ask you guys to pray about is we need $7,000 for language school as soon as we get over there. It is really important to us that we learn the language. Not because we want to say that we've learned a different language. That is awesome, but we need to learn the language so that we can minister to them in their heart language. So that we can tell them about Jesus in their language. We can break down that barrier. So would you please, please pray that we are able to get that $7,000 for language school. Those of you that are, are, not, are watching online, I ask you to pray for us as well. Pray that we're able to get that $7,000 to go to language school so that we can better minister to the people in Uganda. If you have your Bibles today, we're going to go ahead and start in a familiar text. And we're going to start off in Matthew chapter 28. Before we get there, today I really just want to focus on why missions. Why missions? Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for this time that we get to come together and we get to uh, dig into your word. Lord, we ask that just during this time that uh, you'll work in hearts um, just through the preaching of your word, Lord, that uh, people will come to know you, and Lord, that people will have a, a desire for missions. In your name we pray. Amen. Why missions? That is a common question that missionaries are asked. Why would you give up your life here in the U.S. to go somewhere where you know, don't know the language, you don't know anybody? Why would you give up your life for that? Why do we send missionaries? Why? Today, I want to show you three truths from God's word to help you better, better understand why missions is so important. The first truth is that missions is the heart of Christ. In John chapter 4, we see Jesus and the Samaritan woman. If you want to turn over there with me to John chapter 4, we're going to read the first four verses. John chapter 4, verse 1, starting in verse 1, it says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. There's a very telling phrase there in verse 4 of John 4. When, before Jesus went to meet the woman at the well, the verse says that he must needs go through Samaria. That word must means that it had to happen. It was unavoidable. Amen. What this verse is saying is that Jesus had to go through Samaria. There were two highways from Judea to the northern territory of Galilee. One was shorter than the other. Devout Jews would avoid 
this route through Samaria and preferred the longer route to avoid seeing certain people or foreigners on their path. The must of our text was not a necessity imposed by geographical restrictions. The route through Samaria was necessary because there was a woman who needed to hear that Jesus was the living water. When, what we see next is we see that Jesus and this lady is having a conversation. This woman at first is in shock that Jesus is even talking to her because he's a Jew. As it goes on, we see that Jesus tells the lady that he is the living water, an example to you and I of what we are supposed to do. In John 4, 14, it says, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus' heart was so filled with love for the lost. He went the route that others would avoid to reach one woman of a different ethnic group. We see later in this chapter that because of, him, because of Jesus telling that one woman, many came to know him after that. In verse 39, it says, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified. He told me all that I ever did. Because Jesus talked to this woman. This woman went to tell others about him. Jesus came to die for sinners. And all his life, he proclaimed that to others. He was the living water. Reaching people, saving people from sin, that was the heartbeat of Jesus. Matthew 18, 11, Jesus made it very clear what his mission was. He said, for the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Missions is, first of all, the heart of Christ. The second truth we see is that missions is the hope for the lost. Without the gospel, the lost are helpless and hell-bound. Turn with me over to Romans chapter 10. And we're going to start in verse 13. In verse 13, we see both the simplicity and the sufficiency of of the gospel. It says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. According to what we just read, all that one needs to receive full pardon for sins is to call on the Lord and ask him in complete faith to save them. But Paul goes on here in this text because he recognizes a problem. In verses 14 and 15, he says, how then shall they call on him of whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? The problem with reaching the world for Christ is not the simplicity of the gospel, nor the sufficiency of the gospel, but the shortage of people who are willing to go. I used to work in a facility as a medical assistant. And when they're getting ready to train us on new things, they always told us this one story about a client. There was a client who had seizures a lot. And a lot of the times it got to a point where medication had to be administered to help the, this client. One time this, this client began to have a seizure. So the medical aide and the nurse, they did what they were supposed to do. They lowered him to the ground from his chair. They began to follow the beginning processes, hoping that the seizure would go away. But it didn't. He kept on seizing. Finally, it hit a point where it was time to administer the medication needed to help him, to help this client. But the staff, the nurse, they got scared. They got nervous. They have never done this before. So they waited, and they waited, and they waited. 
because they chose not to administer the med that he needed, that client died. Just like this client, we have what people need in order to live. There are people seizing in sin all around us. And we, we have that, that medication or that, that cure for them. But are we going to be like those, th that nurse and that staff? Stand back and say, I'm scared to do this because I've never done it. Or say, somebody else will get to it. Jesus said to go. We need men, women, boys and girls who will go and proclaim Christ boldly. Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come, of, come to repentance. Are you concerned about the lost dying and going to hell? Jesus gave every believer marching orders when he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Here's my question for you today and for those of you at home. What are you doing to reach the lost around the world right now? What are you doing to reach your friends, your families, your neighbors, the people you see outside these doors? What are you doing to reach them for Christ? The first truth about missions is that it is the heart of Christ. The second truth is that missions is the hope for the lost. Our third truth this morning is that missions is the health of the church. Again, Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Did he say some creatures? No, he said every creature. This was the last command from Jesus before he left this earth. So I believe this must be one that is dearest to his heart. Since salvation has been provided for all people, it was Christ's last command and his deepest desire that salvation through him be proclaimed to all everywhere. The mission of the church is missions, both here and throughout the world. That is why it is biblical that missionaries are sent out of the church. I'm not, I'm not going to Uganda just on my own. I am authorized and sent by my sending church in Springfield, Missouri, as an extension of that church to reach the world for the gospel. The missions of the church, church is missions. Earlier in 2 Peter verses, chapter 3, verse 9, Peter said, The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The supreme task of the church is getting the gospel out to everyone. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That is is God's will. That is his desire. And that is his, is his command for you and for me. When God loved, he loved the world. When God gave his son, he gave his son for the world. And when Jesus died, he died for the world. God desires for everyone to have a relationship with him. Although not everyone will choose to accept him, it is still God's desire that the gospel go to everyone in this world. That everyone has an opportunity to know Jesus Christ. And it's God's will that people be saved from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. So why missions? First of all, because it's the heart of Christ. Second, because it's the hope for the lost. Only the gospel can change their life. And last, it's because it's the health of the church. 
I remember one time I asked a missionary the same question, why? I was 10 years old and probably was nervous because it was the first time I had boldness to go up and talk to somebody. And I asked him why. Why missions? Why would you go? And I still remember exactly what that man said to me. He looked down at me and said, son, first of all, because God has called me. That is why I'm going. But he also said, if I don't go, who will? There are people all over this world dying, going to hell. If I don't go, who will? If I don't go to Uganda, who will? If you don't tell the people here in Houston, who will? Today, we're ta I'm talking to two types of people, two groups of people. Whether you're here or at home watching, I'm talking to those that are saved and those that are not saved. Let me talk to you, those that are not saved real fast. Today, we've heard a lot of things about the gospel. The gospel is what changes lives. Just like Romans chapter 10 says, that whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We are all sinners. It is part of our nature. We are born this way. Because of that sin, we are separated from God. But God loved you and I so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. The Bible says that we first have to acknowledge that we are a sinner and repent. We have to acknowledge that we've done these wrong things that goes against God's word. And then we have to repent. We have to turn away from that sin. The Bible then says that we need to believe. We need to believe that Jesus is God's son and that he came to this earth to die on the cross for our sins and that he rose again on the third day. We have to believe that. We have to know that that is true. And then lastly, just like Romans says, if we call upon the name of the Lord and ask him to forgive us of our sins and to come in and make us new, he will do that. You can do that today. If you have never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, let me urge you to get that right with the Lord today. If you're at home, let me urge you to get that right with the Lord today. The second group of people that I'm talking to today are those that are saved. Today, let me encourage you to get involved in missions. There are three ways that every believer can get involved with missions. First, you can pray. Pray for missionaries. Yes, pray for their health, pray for their safety, but more importantly, pray for the people that they are going to see. Pray that, that, that the Lord will use them to reach the people all over the world for Him. Pray that the gospel is given and it's given boldly. You can pray for missionaries. The second way is by giving. When you give an offering to missions, whether it be big or small, that offering changes lives. Because of your offering, because of you giving to missions, you are helping missionaries get to the field. You're helping missionaries stay on the field. And ultimately, you're helping people hear the name of Christ. The last thing you can do is go. We've learned today that we've all been called to go. You guys have a mission field here in Houston. We've all been called to go. But some today, the Lord might be working on your heart about full-time ministry or full-time mission somewhere else. If that's you today, let me encourage you. The best thing you can do is say, here I am, Lord, send me. As a scared boy from College Station, Texas, I never would have imagined that I'd be up here talking to you guys. I am proof that God can use anybody. Pastor? Well, while, while he's standing here, anybody have any questions that you'd like to ask? And he may not be the expert since he's not been a long time. 
Any questions about Uganda? How, how large is the country? The large, the country is 43 million people. Okay, 43 million, and half of them are under 15. Yes, they're over 50% is under the age of 15. So it's a country full of kids. Wow. What else? Wow, you're so quiet. Yes. I'm sorry. Oh, just a minute. Roll back, roll back. Roll back over this. There you go. That's what we're here for. <laughs> now, I was just wondering, is rich, witchcraft something they practice on a daily basis? Um, for the most part, yes. They, at least in the area we are at, there's a witch doctor right down the road. And so many a times, like when something's going on in their life, instead of going to a doctor or anything like that, they go straight to the witch doctor. Um, there's even members in the church where the Daniels, the missionaries that are there, that are attending this Baptist church regularly, that are still struggling with some of these traditional things like wearing beads or something to appease the spirits. So witchcraft is still very present. So do they feel threatened by missionaries coming in? I mean, no. Do you have any Sorry, go ahead. No, I was oh. just saying, do you have any con concerns or? I mean, there is there always is, is concerns, but the people of Uganda are just very open to just really anything. Um, they're very eager to learn about new things, and so they're very open and welcoming to um, to to believers coming in and sh and sharing the gospel with them. Um, but that is why discipleship is going to be very important with these people. Um, because they are so open to everything, it is real easy for them to get influenced by other things. Thank you. They're probably not like our 15-year-olds here. They've not <laughs> been, their minds haven't been corrupted by an education system there that, that makes them so suspicious and negative. Typical 15-year-olds are just open. Tell us something new. And if you can tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. he can change their life. Becky. Yes, I was just wondering, is the reason why there it's 50% young children? Is it the disease that uh, is the reason for so many children and not so many older people? Or are there medical missionaries there also? Um, I am unsure about if there's medical missionaries there. Um, but I do know that this country also for many years, because it was under different dictatorship, but it also had um, a high case of uh, AIDS and different things going on, so a lot of the older people have deceased due to that um, disease. And so majority of the kids are orphans um, running around um, in the different villages. Are the children that are the 50 percent, are they like staying in orphanages? Are they just staying in the streets or who's... It's a, little, these it's a little bit of it all. There are orphanages there. Um, the Daniels that are currently there, they have an orphanage uh, down in a different part of Uganda um, called Imbarada. There is an orphanage there. Um, but many of the kids are just living on the streets. Um, but and our, one of our goals one day is to hopefully help and change that. So we, we love children. What is the official language? The official language in Uganda actually is English um, because many people have came to like the capital city. It's kind of a melting pot. So the official language is English. We are going to be learning the language called Luganda um, because many of the older people don't speak English. The kids are learning English in schools, but a lot of our older people are still speaking those different tribal languages. So the country is made up of many, I think it's 32 different languages and dialects. Um, sounds, kind of, sounds, sounds kind of like the Philippines, where <laughs> the language is English, but they speak Tagala and yes. all the other different dialects. What else? Have you all been to Uganda yet at all? Or yes, sir. Uh, both Janae and I had the privilege to go over there um, during the summer of 2017, just shy of a month. We got to go and work with the Daniels there and see their ministry, see to see the country, and that is when the Lord ultimately confirms in our life that that's where we're supposed to go. Okay. How long do you expect to stay there once you go? Okay. 
what we tell people is we're, we're, we're staying there until the Lord tells us to go somewhere else or the Lord removes us. So we are, we are his. And the language school that you want to go to, is it in the United States or is it over there in Uganda? It is over in Uganda. It is in the capital city. We have the option to go to an actual physical language school or have the language teacher come to us. Of course, it just depends on with our two-year-old what we're going to end up doing. Um, but we will be going to a physical language. Hopefully, we'll have, be doing going through some sort of a language program over in Uganda. Yeah. I wanted to ask you more about the uh, uh, witch doctor stuff. What do they go to them for? And does it, quote unquote, work? If it works, of course, we know it's satanic. The reason why I'm asking is that's a huge hurdle. If, if they're doing something that works, you know, you got to come up with a way to show them, okay, yes, it works, but. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm not 100% sure what all they go for. I know a very common things are when they're having bad health. Instead of like we go to a doc, just a normal doctor when we're not feeling good um, to get a diagnosis they would just go to the witch doctor to get something that's supposed to help them. Um, sometimes if life is going really bad and they feel like the spirits are really basically taking over them, they'll go to the witch doctor to help get something, some sort but sort of, in their words, magical something to help appease those spirits. Um, and if it works, I think it's more of a mind trick, honestly. Um, and that's why I said like these, these people get influenced so easily so easily and so that's why it's really important we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities mm -hmm. and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places how many times throughout our city do you pass by fortune telling places and mm -hmm. those type of things so it's it they go for spiritual guidance and, and we're spiritual creatures mm -hmm. and uh, that wicked spiritual leader will try to meet the needs <laughs> John, D does the government have a, a a stance on missionaries? In other words, do they welcome missionaries or do they not like them? And it also kind of what's the paperwork like for you to go over there, get paperwork uh, to go over there and stay? Okay. Um, the government is very open to missionaries coming and being in the country. Um, they're very open to foreigners coming. Their view on it kind of is if they're coming over, they're going to help the country in some way. Um, so they're very open. As for the actual paperwork, we ha we, we've began looking into it. We know it's a lot just from talking with missionaries that are there. We don't 100% know the whole process and exactly everything that we have to go through. We do know that there is definitely a process. But right now the country's open to missionaries. Yes, the country is 100% open. We can go in as missionaries um, and we can we, we're able to go into schools. There's no, there's no rules or restrictions on any of that. Doesn't sound like America, does it? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? That's why we've kind of changed our format, inviting our missionaries every, to come every week because it helps you to get to know and interact. Anything else you'd like to know about, about Nolan and his family? One, we, we don't have, our church, as of when we started, we don't support anybody in Uganda. But Nolan's going to be our missionary who represents Central Baptist Church in Uganda. Amen? Amen. 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 And folks, he needs to raise his funds for language school. Now, that's just the first need. They've got any, everything from buying a vehicle when they get there to setting up household there, getting airplane tickets. But he's saying to Central Baptist Church, I'd like you to pray for me and give toward helping us with our language school. Amen? Amen. Amen. And we'll take care of that on the first Sunday in February. All right? Anything else? Thank you, Brother Nolan. All right. Appreciate it. Remember this. Pardon? He said he likes to sing. Are you a singer? I, I am, yes, sir. You, can you sing a cappella? I can. Can. What would you like to sing to us? <laughs> Miss Reagan plays the piano. Uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> what, what can you. We can just do Amazing Grace. We can keep it simple. You can play that, can't you, Miss Reagan? All right. She just, fun. I don't know if I can play it. She can play anything. <laughs> she can even play pastor sometimes. <laughs> In fact, most of the time. <laughs> Sharon's been my secretary 
No, I've, I've been here on the, I've been, this is my home church since 1969. I went on the staff in 1972. She's been my secretary for, for 42 years. Anything else? We're going to get a little bit early this morning, but thank you for being here. Roy's got some stuff. We live on the mission field of Katy. People are lost. People are dying. People are headed for an eternity. You know, we hear the simple message of Jesus Christ, and we don't realize that there are there are millions millions and millions of people who've never heard that message. There are people sitting in this community who they've heard the name of Jesus, but they've never understood the simplicity that is faith in Jesus Christ plus nothing minus nothing. Folks go to church and think they've got to do certain things be saved. Anything you add, anything to Jesus Christ, you subtract from Him. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no man can come to the Father but through me. Nolan is going to take that message to Uganda. And a lot of those kids, millions of those kids, Roy? Amen. Well, as Pastor said last week, keeping in uh, line with missions, we have a mission right here, and we've asked you, he asked you last week to think about someone that was in your life every day who you knew needed Jesus. And many of you prayed for that person here or in your seat last week. Do not stop praying for that person. Keep, you're going to hear this from us every week. Keep that person on your heart and in your mind and continue to pray for them and that God would open up opportunities for you to be the hands and feet and mouthpiece of Jesus Christ to share with them God's love. Please keep that in your minds. We're going to keep bringing that to you and keep reminding you of it because we have a special plan throughout the month of February. And we believe God's going to save some of these people in February. And I believe that if we'll keep asking, He can save every one of them. Amen? Do you believe that? Say amen. Oh, wow. Don't expect a lot of you don't believe He can do it. But if you believe it, I'm telling you, He will do it. He said you have not because you ask not. So we need to be praying for these people that God's put into our lives. 
Amen. Does God answer prayer? Yes, He does. A few announcements. Next uh, January is Blood Drive Month. And uh, we're having a blood drive this coming Saturday, January the 16th, here at Central. A mobile unit will be here from 9 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. next Saturday in our parking lot. And uh, you should have received an email this past week with instructions on how to make an appointment. If you did not receive that, um, these instructions are available uh, out in the lobby and by all of our exits. Um, there's also a list there giving details of the blood drive. We also have choir rehearsal this afternoon at 1.30 with Ms. Sharon, 1.30 this afternoon. Rejoice Choir is fixing to get ready to make preparations, getting underway for our Easter uh, musical on April the 4th. Uh, no auditions are necessary. Don't think, well, I've got to go try out. No, just like the missionaries, all you have to do is be willing and show up, right? And uh, so we would love to have you in our choir, just a desire to serve the Lord with your heart and with your voice is all that's needed. So this afternoon, 1.30, just come back to the church. As we continue our Stewardship Missions Month, our speaker for next Sunday, uh, today we have someone that is uh, new and has not yet been to the field. Next week, we will have Brother John Barnes, who has been in Costa Rica for many, many years, and God has used him and his family and his ministry to reach thousands of people in Costa Rica and we have had a privilege of being a part of that ministry for many years so you come next week and be encouraged by what God has already done and be challenged as what God would continue to do there in the nation of Costa Rica and then on Sunday uh, February the 7th at the end of our stewardship missions month just a reminder uh, there are four very important things that will happen on that Sunday so whether you'll be here in person or whether you'll be online I want you to be in prayer about this number one our guest speaker is going to be Brother Rick Carter. He's very familiar to Central. Great man of God. Loves the Word of God and a wonderful pastor. On that day, we will have All Ties Sunday. So be praying about that and what God would have you to do as far as that's concerned. And then we're also having Commitment Sunday on that day. And that's where we fill out commitment cards and we make commitments in our heart to the Lord. And let me say at the beginning, and we'll say it again then, you're not making a commitment to Pastor Larry or to the office that you're going to give. You're making a commitment to God. And so you need to be praying, Lord, what would you have me to do? And whatever he lays on your heart, you should just follow him in obedience and do that what he has laid upon your heart. And then understand this, when you write it on that commitment card, actually we have two cards. I think the, the one that has given, there's not even a place for a name. But we would like to be able to look at those cards and see where we're at as far as the commitment is. But since there's no name you can know, you can make your commitment, your commitments to God. You're not going to be contacted in April if, we, if you weren't given it, saying, hey, you're, you're not living up to your commitment. That would be between you and God. But there's another commitment card for service. Because we have a ministry here, and we need people to serve in order to do the ministry of Central Baptist Church. And that card, there is a place for your name because we need to contact you in order to get you serving. And then on that last, that first Sunday in February, our last day of our stewardship emphasis month, we're going to receive an offering. And just like Nolan and Janae need $7,000 for language school, I'm sure Brother Barnes next week will have something that he needs. And then our missionaries to Israel will have something that they need. And every year this church overwhelmingly shows love in the way of giving for our missionaries and uh, we're able to bless them. So you be in prayer right now how God would have you to help give in that love offering. And here's two things I'll tell you and we'll pray. You can give, like maybe today God said, I want you. And some people might think, well, I might only be able to give $10. That's great. God will bless you for what you give. But we've seen it happen before where one person will say, you know what? I'm going to send them to language school. You can designate on your offering envelope. Nolan and Janae Language School. And whatever you give, whether it's $10 or $7,000, will put them to language school. But you might just want to say, you know what? I'm just going to give to the love offering to all of them and all of their needs. Then you just put love offering, and then it will be divided amongst them evenly. But if God moves in your heart for a specific need, you can contribute to that specific need. So start praying now how God would want you to give to help these missionaries go do the work of the gospel. Amen? Amen? I love y'all. Let's stand together and we'll pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your love for us. We thank you and we praise you for the blessings 
that you've given to us. And Lord, we're thankful today for the Laternos and their willingness to go. We pray, God, that you would be with them as they are traveling and ministering and sharing their burden for Uganda with churches all over this country. And Lord, we pray that you would just provide all the funds necessary for them to get to the field and begin to reach the people of Uganda. We love you and we thank you, Lord, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.